time we'll be now favored with a special item of music by the gems of the church, the children. So let's sit back and listen to the message as they give us in song. Thank you, children. Thank you, children, for that beautiful song. Amidst all the toil and the problems in the world, we can have, find peace because we serve the Prince of Peace. Thanks for the message in song. At this time, we now lis listen to the sermon, which is entitled, Do We Know Better? Do we know better? Joy will now present the message. Let's give him our undivided attention at this time. Thank you. the Sabbath, everyone. As, uh, as always, it's my pleasure to be able to be here with you, uh, to be able to present the Word of God. And as always, it's my wish and prayer that all of us can leave here today uh, learning something new uh, and uh, taking a, a better look at our lives and understanding what we need to do to prepare ourselves for His soon second coming. I have to tell you, it's, uh, it's weird coming to church without my, uh, my family. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Bida and the kids couldn't be here today. The kids weren't feeling so well. And uh, it's weird being here uh, without them. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I, I am happy being here. I'm happy being with my church family. And um, today, I want to talk about, uh, as was mentioned, do we know better? Uh, to start out, I'll tell you, I think we do. I think we do know better in a lot of cases. And we justify not doing what we know is right. And I want you to keep that in mind as, uh, as we go throughout uh, the sermon today. A few months ago, I received something that I've been looking for for a long time. It's a real nerdy thing that has to do with my profession and something I care about. And if anyone else saw it, they probably wouldn't care, but I was really excited when I got it. And it's called a Revigator. And I assume that most people wouldn't know what that is. But um, as humanity uh, was learning about radiation in the early 1900s, um, they found that radioactive materials could be used for all sorts of things. 
Uh, some of them beneficial. Uh, some of them at the time thought uh, was um, even good for you. Uh, so in some cases, they put uh, a radium paint, they put it on dials of watches, so those watches could glow in the dark, and you could see your watch, and you could, you know, at nighttime, you could take a look beside your bed, and you'd see your, your clock glowing, you know what time it was, and they said, hey, here's this beneficial use of this new thing that we've discovered. At the same time, uh, they found that, um, or they thought, that maybe consumption of some of these materials would actually be good for you. So they made devices where um, you would actually get different radiation doses from, from, um, from these materials. And one of these devices was a Revigator. And what it was, is it was a jug that was made out of radium ore, a water jug. So you put, you put it someplace in your kitchen or whatever, you filled it up with water, and they wanted you to leave it overnight so that, that way the radioactive daughter products from the radium ore would get into the water and then you drink the water. And uh, they thought it was good for you at the time. They thought it was good for one's health. Um, the jug even had some instructions on the side that said how to, what to do to get the most out of it so you could get the most benefit from, uh, from using this device. Um, in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15, there's a verse I want to read before I keep going. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. It says there that the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. So the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. So throughout humanity, it seems that we, as we kind of continue to discover this world around us that uh, God has created, um, sometimes we make some pretty bad decisions on things that we maybe should have known better about or maybe didn't do enough investigation into. And we look back on these decisions and we think, how could, how could we have done that? Whether it's ourselves or whether it was, you know, people before us. How, you know, what were we thinking at the time when we did these things? The uh, Revigator is just a random example that I know of just because of my professional background. But how about other things? You know, you consider smoking or, you know, tanning beds or, you know, fluoride in water when they wanted to put fluoride in all the drinking water and so on. You know, the, we come up with these ideas that, you know, we think it's a good idea and really don't have the facts to justify it. But we keep going ahead anyway. And how long, if uh, we consider the case of smoking, uh, how long was it before they knew that uh, it wasn't so good for you? Now, looking back at these things, um, we can only feel sorry for people that were hurt um, or maybe even lost their lives by, uh, as a result of some of these decisions that were made. Um, the question is, when our children and people before us look back at us today and the decisions that we made and the things that we did, um, what are they going to think about us? What are they going to think about the decisions that we made and why we think we made them? Will they think that um, we should have known better? Will they feel sorry for us? It's hard to feel sorry for somebody when they knew better right? It's like, we should feel sorry for everyone. I mean, we should try and help people. We should, but, but it's hard to feel sorry for somebody when they know better. Um, once uh, Bida and I were driving up to Blue Mountain, it was before we had kids, and uh, we were just going to go up for the, for the day on a Sunday, and I decided I was going to take some of the back roads, and as I was driving on those back roads, I figured, you know, what are the chances of there being any police on these roads? There's no one out here, right? What are the chances? So I was driving excessively, and I shouldn't have been, and Bilya looked at me and she said, where's the fire? Relax. It's, it's Sunday. You know, where, where's the rush? You know, why rush? Ah, oh, no, no. Don't worry. I got, no one's, no, don't worry about it. I want to get there faster. I want to join more of the day and so on. Well, as you know it, I was the fool and I was pulled over. And do um, you think Bilya felt sorry for me? Oh, no, she didn't. Uh, I feared her more than I, more than I feared the cop in that, uh, that situation. Do you think there was an excuse that I could have given that police officer um, that he would have felt sorry for me? No, I, I don't think there was. There was, there was nothing that was going to help me out of that situation. It's hard to feel sorry for someone or even for yourself when you knew the right thing and you didn't do it. They sh I should have known better. But now turning to our spiritual lives and why we are here today. Uh, how many times have we done something that we know is wrong and we do it anyway. 
we, for instance, talk about health reform. And all vegetarians, let's say, that part of health reform, we're very good at making sure that we you know, stay away from meat products. In some cases, we might even be vegan and we stay away from dairy products as well. And we consider this a big part of health reform. But is being a vegetarian and being vegan, is that really the main part of health reform? Is that really all there is? No, absolutely not. Um, there are so many other important aspects to that. How many of us spend at least an hour a day outside, fresh air, sun? How many of us actually get a good night's rest? How many of us actually sleep eight hours? How many of us actually do these things? How many of us exercise regularly? How many of us do these things? Sometimes, you know, we hold on to one thing because we understand it, um, and, you know, we've kind of incorporated it into our lives, but, but we're not really looking at the whole picture. And then we get sick, and we get disappointed. We say, how could this have happened? I've been a vegetarian for, you know, 30 years, and, uh, you know, take pretty good care of myself and eat right, and somehow I'm still getting sick. How did this happen? What am I doing wrong? But we know what's right, and we rationalize it away. And in doing so, we end up being the fool that was mentioned in uh, Proverbs chapter 12. The other week, we were having uh, evening prayer with uh, Oliver and Oscar, and uh, we were reading a story that's found in uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27. So in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27, it says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Do you really think that the foolish man thought it was a good idea to build his house upon the sand? Do you really think he thought it was a good idea? I, I can't believe he did. I don't think he actually thought it was a good idea. Everything that we do has some risk associated with it. Everything that we do. We need to weigh those risks, and then we make decisions based on that. For instance, I have a friend that uh, owns some properties in Florida that uh, he rents out. And I asked him, why would you buy properties in a place that gets hit by hurricanes all the time and causes damage to your properties, and you have to deal with that damage? What were you thinking? Why, why bother? Or why not find someplace else that doesn't have those problems? And he said, listen, I understood that when I bought the properties, and those costs are already incorporated into the you know, cost of the rent and cost of all the other things associated with it. And I myself never go down there during hurricane season. So you know, it's a risk. Yeah, I understand that risk, and I've mitigated that risk. But is that enough? Isn't that kind of what gets us in trouble in the first place? We think we understand the risks. We think we've mitigated the risks with making different decisions, but it still gets us into trouble. I want to read a short statement uh, from the book Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 62. It says, The foundation firmly laid. We need wisdom that we may know how to build. When Moses was about to erect the sanctuary in the wilderness, he was cautioned. See that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. In his law, God has given us the pattern. Our character building is to be after the pattern shown to thee in the mount. The law is the great standard of righteousness. It represents the character of God and is the test of our loyalty to his government. And it is revealed to us in all his beauty and excellence in the life of Christ. So sometimes we do things to rationalize the risk. Oh, it's okay to you know, speed on this street because I've been driving there to work for you know, so many years and I've never seen a cop. So you know what, I, I figure today I'm in a bit of a rush and I'm gonna take that chance. Um, sometimes we, we think we understand the risk. The foolish man here, I think that he, he knew that it wasn't the best idea, but he thought he understood the risk. And that when the rains came, it wouldn't be so bad. And maybe they wouldn't be, there wouldn't be so much rain. And, uh, you know, maybe it was a really nice location with a really nice view. And he said, hey, you know, I'd love to have that. And yeah, I understand this is the risk and I'll, I'll take that risk. 
how careful we need to be to make sure that our foundation is firmly laid um, so that we are ready for all the storms that may come our way. I'd like to spend the m most of our time this morning looking at an example of the lawyer that uh, came to Jesus with the question that we find in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. So in Luke chapter 10, verse 25, it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? In essence, this is the question that all Christians want answered. Right? This is the question we all want answered. If we didn't want to be saved, then really we probably wouldn't be here today. Right? Why, why bother? Why, why would we want to be here today? Um, what we really want to know, though, when we ask this question, or what I think a lot of us want to know when we ask this question, and I think what this lawyer wanted to know when he asked this question is, what is the minimum I have to do to be saved? What, what's the minimum? Where's the line? How can I make the most and enjoy the, my life on this earth to the fullest and still be saved? That's really what we want to know. That's really why we ask this question. That's why this lawyer is asking this question. He might have been tempting Jesus here, but I think this is the same question that a lot of us ask ourselves, especially when we talk about risks and making different decisions. Before we continue, we need to make sure that we don't miss a fundamental point in the question that this lawyer asked. He asked, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Did you hear it? What shall I do to inherit? What shall I do? So the assumption is that he must do something. And this is not an assumption that's unique to him. It was an assumption and, and something that was really held by the Jews at the time, right? They felt that they needed to do something. They needed to do something themselves and that they could work out their own salvation based on the works that they did. This lawyer was one that was in the Jewish leadership. And in the accounts of opposition that uh, Jesus ran into uh, while um, in his earthly ministry, the people that uh, confronted him often were the scribes and the Pharisees and, and the leadership of, of the Jews at the time. This lawyer that posed the question to Jesus knew the answer that he was looking for. And this wasn't really a question for additional enlightenment for this individual. It was really just a trap that he was trying to set for Christ. And these are the types of questions that we really need to be careful of ourselves getting into. There are those out there that are really just looking to bring us down and uh, to ask us the type of questions and get us talking about maybe different things that really have no value for our spiritual life. So in order to defend our faith, do we need to really entertain every foolish question that comes our way? Do we really have to do that? And now let's read what it says in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 3. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 3, it says, It is an honor for a man to seize from strife, but every fool will be meddling. If we put our, let ourselves be put into... Uh, or pulled into every foolish question and conversation that are started by really those who are really just trying to sow seeds of discord and, and find issues, um, then we'll find in ourselves in a place that we don't like to be. We'll also find in our, ourselves in a place where there's really no end. Because really there is no end to those type of questions and those type of conversations, right? They just keep building and going and going and asking more questions that many times have nothing to do with our salvation. We know that this lawyer's motivation was wrong. For the word uh, in the Bible, it says that he tempted Jesus. So he wanted to record Jesus' answer. He wanted to report back to the Jewish leadership and to find something against Jesus. That's why he was asking. He was trying to tempt him. But we know that uh, this lawyer was very wrong. So instead of giving an answer that the lawyer expected, we find that Jesus answered the question with a question. And we find that question in Luke chapter 10, verse 26. Luke chapter 10, verse 26. It says, And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? So lawyers are typically the ones that ask the questions, right? 
typically if you're having a, you know, some sort of a court case, it's the lawyer asking the question. But this wasn't a court case, and we find that the shoe is now on the other foot. And this man is now forced into the uncomfortable spotlight that he was trying to put Jesus into. And now he's forced to show others what he knows. And can he answer this question? Um, as I said earlier, we know that this man was knowledgeable in the scriptures. And we find his textbook answer. It's in uh, Luke. If just read further in Luke chapter 10, verse 27. It says, And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. So this, sam this answer really sums up the, uh, the Ten Commandments. The first part of the answer is our duty to God and, our, and, uh, and what's required of us there. And uh, the second part is our duty to others. So we find that in Luke chapter 28 that, um, that uh, Jesus responds that this is the correct answer. And he tries to end the conversation there. So he tries to say, yes, you've answered the question. You got it. You know, that's, that's the summary. Love towards God, love towards fellow man. You know, let's stop this conversation there. Um, so we can see that. Let's read in uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 28. It says, and, Jesus, and he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. So, you have the right answer. However, that didn't really make the lawyer feel at ease because he didn't really get out of this conversation what he was looking for. So, um, the spotlight that he put on Jesus was now on him. He gave the answer. Now the spotlight seems to be back on him as people saying, well, what, what were you really trying to get out of that? It's interesting that um, when those that are trying to trap someone end up being the one getting trapped, um, how they act. You know, so this lawyer, you know, he was trying to get up, trying to, you know, be smart about something, trying to, trying to get, you know, what he wanted out of, uh, out of Christ. And now the table's turned and it's at him. And he's panicking. What do I do? What do I say? Where, where am I going from here? He's trying to hide. And, um, and the way that they hide is by trying to turn it back. So in this case, uh, we see in, uh, in Luke chapter 10, verse 29, that he asks another question to try and get Jesus back into this conversation. So in Luke chapter 10, verse 29, it says, But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? What uh, we can see here is that trying to justify himself, the lawyer asks this question. He was doing the oldest trick in the book when he was caught. He's setting up an excuse for why he's not doing what he knows is right. The first answer that he gave. Let's look at it. He answered Jesus' question right, but now he sees by his own words that he's been left wanting. And he's left wanting because uh, he hasn't loved God completely and he hasn't loved his neighbors completely. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure that this person gave uh, a lot of love towards the people that he considered his neighbors. You know, that he considered his friends, that he considered his family. But by answering this question, he could see that something was missing. And we find in the book uh, Christ Objects Lessons on page 376 that the question of who is your neighbor was a hot topic at that time. So in uh, the book Christ Object Lessons on page 376, it says, among, Jew among the Jews, the question, who is my neighbor, caused endless dispute. They had no doubt as to the heathen and the Samaritans. These were strangers and enemies. But where should the distinction be made among the people of their own nation and among the different classes of society? Whom should the priest, the rabbi, the elder regard as a neighbor? They spent their lives in a round of ceremonies to make themselves pure. Contact with the ignorant and careless multitude they thought would cause defilement and would require wearisome effort to remove. Were they to regard the unclean as neighbors? The more I think of it, the more I see us in this lawyer. There are those that, um, that we show love to, and there's sometimes those that we don't. 
We show love to those that are part of the things that we do, those that are part of our family, those that are part of our, maybe our circle of friends, maybe people that we work with, people that we know. Um, but sometimes if, uh, you know, we come in, into contact with people that aren't from those circles, um, we don't really treat them in the same way. We don't really give them uh, the same affection or care. Particularly if it's somebody that, um, that maybe did something bad to us or maybe somebody that, uh, that wasn't nice to us in the, in the past. I'm sure that we've all heard the story of the Good Samaritan. And uh, in the interest of time, not, I'm not going to go into too much detail on it now. Uh, it's found in Luke chapter 10, verses 30 to 37. But uh, just quickly in summary, we know that there's a Jewish man. He's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Uh, he's attacked by thieves, and he's left for dead. And afterward, a Jewish priest comes by, and he walks past him and doesn't offer him any help. And then a Levite comes by, and he does the same, offers him no help. In the Christ Object Lessons on page 378, we find that the parable of the Good Samaritan was not just a story, but it was a real occurrence, and that it was fresh in the mind of the hearers that were actually listening to Jesus on that day. Um, we can read the following about the Levite in Christ Object Lessons. It says, The Levite was curious to know what had happened. He stopped. He looked at the sufferer. He was convicted of what he ought to do, but it was not an agreeable duty. He wished that he had not come that way so that he would not have seen the wounded man. He persuaded himself that the case was of no concern of his, and he too passed by on the other side. Has this ever happened to you? Have you ever come across a situation, whatever it may be, where you knew that you, should, you could do something to help someone, and you didn't do it? You avoided it. You asked yourself the same question, oh, why now? I'm so busy. Or, oh, you know, if I only didn't come this way, then I wouldn't even feel bad about this. How many times have we found ourselves in that situation? Our lives may be busy, but we have a duty. And we really need to find the time to help those that are in need. But as we know, the story goes that a Samaritan, um, who should really dislike him because he's a Jew, uh, saw him, he stopped to help, he had compassion upon this man, he bound his wounds, he took him to an inn so that he could recover, and he even covered all of his expenses. We find some important information about the Samaritan that we really need to consider in the book Desire of Ages. On page 503 in the book Desire of Ages, it says, The Samaritan well knew that were their condition reversed, the Jewish man would spit in his face and pass him by with contempt. But he did not hesitate on account of this. He did not consider that he himself might be in danger of violence by tarrying in the place. It was enough that there was before him a human being in need and suffering. So both the Jewish priest and the Levite, they pass by their countrymen, forsaking the opportunity to help him. While a Samaritan, who as we can read here in the Desire of Ages, knowing that this man probably would have never helped him, decided to go out of his way and to help him. And uh, we know when we talk about the Jews and the Samaritans, we know that there was a lot of conflict there. And there was a lot of, uh, even to call it hatred, there between those two people or those two uh, I guess nations, if you want to call it. And uh, even when we talk about Christ when he was uh, at the well, you know, it was weird to even ask for water. It was weird to even ask for water, which is uh, especially for um, that area, uh, the Middle East, uh, you know, to, to not offer somebody water when they ask for it. Um, I mean, that's, that's really wrong in that time. But so much was their hatred that, uh, that it was weird for her to have him come. You know, in most cases, people would rather just go thirsty than have to ask a Samaritan. A Jew would go thirsty rather than ask a Samaritan to help him or give him water. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Christ illustrated the religion of community. He showed that it was not uh, to be found in systems, creeds, or rites, but in the actual givings of oneself to help others. Uh, it was to be found in the performance of loving acts of kindness, asking for nothing in return. The question is, are we really willing to practice this principle ourselves? 
when we come across maybe similar situations. In uh, Christ Object Lessons, again, on page 380, I'd like to read a paragraph. It says, In giving this lesson, Christ presented the principles of the law in a direct, forcible way, showing his hearers that he had neglected to carry out these principles. His words were so definite and pointed that the listeners could find no opportunity to cavail. The lawyer found in the lesson nothing that he could criticize. His prejudice in regard to Christ was removed, but he had not overcome his national dislike sufficiently to give credit to the Samaritan by name. When Christ asked, Which now of these three thinkest thou was thy neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? He answered, He that showed mercy upon him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do likewise. Show the same tender kindness to those in need. Thus you will give evidence that you keep the whole law. The golden rule that the Samaritan followed here is love thy neighbor as thyself. And in so doing, he showed that our neighbor doesn't mean merely just maybe a member of the church, maybe our actual physical neighbor, or the people that we come into contact with regularly, whether it's at school or work or so on. It has no reference to race, color, class. Um, our neighbor is every person that needs our help. Our neighbor is every soul who's wounded, who's bruised, and by the adversary and needs our help. Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God. But look at Jesus' closing question. Which of these three do you think proved to be neighbor to the man who fell amongst the robbers? Do you hear it? He asked, the lawyer had asked, who is my neighbor? And Jesus turned it around and said, you're asking the wrong question. The, na the question is not who is my neighbor, but to whom I should be neighborly. And that's really what the lawyer was asking with in the first place, right? He was, trying to, he was trying to draw that line again. You know, how far do I have to go to be saved, but still do what I want to do? That's what the lawyer was really asking. And Christ turned that around on him. And we know that the lawyer understood it at the end, because we can see that in uh, Christ Object Lessons, and we can see it in the Bible in the way that he answered. He said, the one that showed mercy towards him. Then Jesus said, go and do the same. The church of Jesus Christ, the church that he said he would build and that would stand against uh, Satan and, uh, and our adversaries, the church, I would remind you, uh, it was made for a purpose. And I need to tell you that it has nothing to do with this building. Other than the fact that this building serves as a place that we can come together, that we can study, and that we can learn. But other than that, it has nothing to do with this building. Church is not something that we go to. It has to be something that we are. We as a collection of members, as a collection of people, we make up the church of God. It's us. You know, sometimes at, uh, at work, um, I hear people complaining about, oh, you know, the company is doing this and the company is doing that. And I'm saying... You're the company. It's, we all make up the company. It's us. You can't, can't blame some, you know, whatever you want to call it, committee or something like that. Our, it's in our hands. We have, we have the ability to make changes. Same thing goes for the church. We can't complain about the church. We are the church. We have the ability to make changes. We have the make ability to do good. Uh, and we are what makes up this church. Um... In other words, um, we are the, um, a group of individuals that have to love and care not only for each other, but for others as well, particularly taking into account the example of the Samaritan that we see here. As members and visitors of this church, we're all at different stages of our walk with Christ when it comes, uh, when it comes to our spirituality. But the important thing is that we need to know that we will be judged on what we know. And as I said earlier, I think we know a lot. I really do. I think we all know a lot. I think we all know better. Question is, are we really doing it? Are we really doing what we know is right? We all need to know Jesus better. I think we need to know ourselves better too. We need to raise our thinking. We need to raise our attitude. And we need 
to realize that our future is, is in our hands. Our salvation is in our hands. We have to make the decision so that, that we can put that in Christ's hands so that he can help us. It's my wish and prayer today that we can all realize that we need to get out of the weeds. We need to get out of the legalism, the definitions of trying to find that line where, you know, if we can just be on this side of the line, then, you know, we could still enjoy this. But we need to stop doing that ourselves. We need to stop trying to define that line and just realize that we need to give our hearts to the Lord. We need to get away from those things that are distracting us from being the church that was designed for a purpose, being the people that make up that church. And it's my wish and prayer that uh, we can all truly love one another, that we can truly understand who our neighbors are and do what we know is right to help those around us. And that uh, we can uh, prepare ourselves uh, for his soon second coming, understanding what's needed from each and every one of us. It's my wish and prayer for all of us today. Amen. I'd like to thank Joey for that very important message from God's Word. We hope that we will meditate on it as the day goes by and as the weeks go by. At this time, we'll bring our service to close by singing hymn number five, sorry, 252. There's a line that is drawn.
definitely kneel for prayers, Brother Joy, give us the closing. Our Father, we turn to heaven. Lord, we thank you for bringing us here together on this Sabbath day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come in peace and to be able to study your word together. And we ask that uh, you can touch each and every one of our hearts today, that uh, you can help us to understand the messages that uh, we uh, hear and study, and that um, you can help us understand what uh, we need to do, what we need to change in our lives. Help us to understand that uh, we do know better and help us to understand how we can be a better influence to those that we come into contact with, that um, we can understand that all of your creatures are our neighbors and that uh, we need to do what we can to help everyone. We ask that uh, you can forgive our sins. We thank you for the sacrifice those made so we can have an opportunity to eternal life. We ask that uh, you can be with those that uh, could not be with us here today for whatever reason. We ask especially that you can be with those that um, are uh, sick and suffering. We remember especially uh, today uh, Brother DePaul and we ask that uh, you can uh, be with him as he recovers and his family as they uh, support him. We ask that uh, you can be with uh, uh, Miss Knowles and, uh, and help her as well through this uh, time that uh, she's going with and that you can give her uh, your healing hand and that you can be with all those. Uh, you know each and every one and what their needs are. Be with those that are uh, searching for your truth. Help us to be able to do uh, your work uh, to reach those around us. All these things we ask and we thank you, Lord, not because we are worthy, but through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We have now come to the end of our service, and we pray that you will continue to study God's Word and to give Him the praise and the thanks. Let's remember, we're still in the hours of the Sabbath, even as we fellowship downstairs. Bless the Sabbath to you all.